Hello and welcome to this social science short. My name is Dr Kate Pangborn and I'm a deputy director of the Leeds Social Sciences Institute and an associate professor in the Institute for Transport Studies. And one of the things that we do at LSSI is work to promote the impact of social sciences at the University of Leeds. And with this in mind, uh, we have invited today's guest to discuss his research. And I'm really delighted to introduce you to Graham Farrell, who's Professor of Crime Science in the School of Law here at the University of Leeds. Um, welcome, Graham. And let me begin by asking you to reveal what object you've brought today that links into your research. Hi, Kate. Thank you for the invitation. I have brought my very old iPhone 3 that I bought in early 2008 when iPhones first came out. It links to my research in various ways. I was completing a, a research project on phone theft, and it's a fantastic example of how um, something that brings great progress in society, you know, technological change that brings enormous um, social benefit through communi improved th communication, also brings great new crime opportunities. So at a time when most crimes have been in decline for many, many years, apart from cybercrime, a separate issue. Phone theft increased dramatically from when mobile phones were first introduced in the, in the 1990s. And the new smartphones brought a second wave of, of phone theft. Crime opportunities are generated by social progress. Media representation of crime is that it's due to you know social problems, social uh, poverty, etc., poor education, poor parenting. And in fact, well, a lot of my research is about the fact that that's not the case. We, ha they, they, in fact, social progress goes hand in hand with crime. The, the internet is another great example. Fantastic social progress, but has generated a whole slew of new cyber crimes. You know, the opportunity for those that a lot of people are taking. So it's not that people have changed, it's the, the level of crime opportunities. Can you describe a sort of research project that um, you think will interest the listeners? brings out some of this uh, sort of slightly counterintuitive thinking? The main research that followed after my research onto phone, phone theft has related to how there have been long-term declines in crime in most developed countries. Again, this is not necessarily widely known because it's not news for the media. So most people tend to think crime is still increasing. But car theft has gone down 80 or 90 percent from what it was in the early 1990s. Uh, burglary has gone down about three quarters. Assault and violence of various type. But the one that's gone in the other, other direction um, is, is cyber crime, which is becoming more prominent. My work is focused on trying to explain why crime types have declined. What we found is that it's due to relatively simple changes in crime opportunities and that was the link to the phone theft. Um, mm -hmm. It's become much harder to, it's, it's very difficult to break into a car nowadays, it's got good locks and if you can break in you can't hotwire it because unless you're a real expert because it's um, got a built-in that stops you driving off with it across different types of crime that there have been declines and our research suggests you know household security has improved dramatically. It used to be in the 70s, 80s, a lot of households didn't have any security at all. And now uh, the default tends to be built in good security locks, increasingly security lighting and things. And these have had a dramatic effect on burglary. And this is across the whole of developed countries, North America, Western Europe. So it's got huge implications for how we understand crime and how we go about addressing crime. Because we have, I think, the essence of a methodology for approaching other types of crime. So I can remember how insecure they were and how insecure houses were. I suppose uh, where I live in, in Aberdeenshire, there's quite a lot of very expensive cars and there is still quite a lot of car theft here. But it's like what you're saying, it's kind of specific vehicle types are being stolen to order by professional exactly. Exactly. groups. So it seems to me that what you're describing is that the sort of impulsive, opportunistic crime by people that are looking for kicks d diminishing because it's less easy. And so the criminals are almost professional class because it requires skills. Professional vehicle theft and professional crime has also declined dramatically over, over time because it's become more difficult, but not as dramatically as crime amongst adolescents mm. who were taking the easier opportunities. And teenagers would learn how to commit crime on a lot of these very easy crimes. But security of improvements have also brought it down amongst older, more professional criminals, but not by as much. 
And the approach that society needs to adopt is to encourage industry, car manufacturers, builders to adopt new security measures to stop these easy crime opportunities arising and to respond to efforts by offenders to try and circumvent security. I was just going to go back to the phone Mm. and why I brought it as an object, because the way in which we respond to phone theft is a great example of what I think of as ethical and elegant security. Good illustration of it. So phone theft was an enormous wave of crime. Best response to phone theft is to have phones that are automatically disconnected from the network when they're stolen through what's called blacklisting. So it doesn't make phone theft any harder, but what it does is removes the reward to stealing a phone because if you steal the handset, it's not worth it. You can't sell it on if it becomes useless. You know, different than the um, stereotype of target hardening. But even target hardening can become quite elegant. So in modern vehicles, you you don't notice it as the driver. You know, one click of a button, a whole suite of security measures clicks into place. And again, I would say, I would argue that is very ethical, very elegant. It's not time consuming. It used to be that we would have add-on crook locks that you would feed through the steering wheel that were awkward. And as as we've improved um, security and the best security is ethical and seamless, I would say. Okay, that's so, really interesting. I've, I've never heard it. I've never heard security described as ethical and elegant before. I think that's a really interesting perspective. Maybe not everybody understands what target hardening is. Yes, just so target hardening is adding locks and bolts. Basically, will be a characterization of it, or making things stronger using mm. stronger materials. Window frame and doors in households used to be poor quality materials that could easily be kicked in, broken. So now double paned glass, stronger window frames, integrated locks make it much more difficult to break into a house. So yeah. the, the target is hardened. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. If crime overall is still reducing, apart from in certain areas where obviously it's become as social progress, as you started off describing, has, has led to these very beneficial technological developments. It's also led to new opportunity for people with criminal intent. Your work touch on how the pipeline for the the criminal behaviour has changed over time because you talked at the beginning about the sort of perspective that the of, about what is the cause of crime yes in terms of criminal careers recent key finding level of easy crime opportunities for a cohort of teenagers influences the proportion of young people who go on to longer criminal careers yes. So in criminology, offenders can be characterised into two main types. Adolescent limited offending, which is most people after the late teens. But some offenders continue. Those who go on to career in criminality, being more prolific or more frequent offenders through their life course. And the term that's used is life course offending. What we have found is that this generated a wave of young offenders with a higher proportion who went on to continue to offend across their life course. So that when crime rates had come down by, say, 2010, and very few, relatively, teens were then entering into crime, rates amongst teens were much lower, there was a little lump of older offenders in their 40s who were committing crimes at higher rates than you would expect for that age group because, we conjecture, um, they had learned their trade when crime was very easy, so more of them have continued. So there's a, a legacy effect of easy crime that prevailing in society. More offenders continue on, and this is tremendously important, I think, for how we think about crime. And perhaps how we address it as well. Yes, exactly. Yeah. A recent example, there are moves to make contactless credit card payments available for up to £100. Limit early in the pandemic was increased from £30 to £45. The argument being that people did not have to touch the handset or the machine and that they would not transmit COVID. The contactless limit increased to £100 has been justified under that argument as well. We now understand that COVID is transmitted much more by aerosol and that it's not the contact that causes it. And we wrote a short note saying that this is actually likely to increase crime because theft of wallets, theft of bags will become a much more attractive prospect. And this is something that's been had been declining for years and I would anticipate it will be an increase in theft of wallets, 
credit cards in order to make contactless payments easily with stolen cards. And this this could have a, a knock-on effect for many, many years. It'll be, it will occur after the pandemic. The long-term effects, if younger, if a, if a large, a larger cohort, so we say, or a larger proportion of current cohorts of young people get into crime, could have longer-term knock-on effects. Okay. I feel that we really need to talk about how you research. What kind of methods can you bring to bear? A range of different methods. I mean, the research about the extent of crime based a lot in crime victim surveys, which are much more accurate than police data because a lot of crime is not reported to the police. But at the same time, we do use police data for some things because it has some strengths. If you can gauge it against victim survey data to and gauge its strengths and weaknesses. I've also worked with people from different disciplines, for example. So when I did my research on phone theft, at that time I was working with an engineer mm-hmm. and we were looking at the design of phones and how you might um, try to um, introduce biometric things that we ne- that are now commonplace, mm-hmm. that at that time weren't used as a means of making phones less, less attractive to steal. And we did a review of the design issues in phone. Different methodologies tailored to the different type of issue and problem. Are there any uh, disciplines that, that you haven't worked with that you're interested in working with? Or methods? Crime science seeks to be multidisciplinary and it, I would say is inherently much more dis- interdisciplinary than the traditional view of criminology. Uh, architects and designers ought to be involved in crime. It's to be multidisciplinary, and it, I would say is inherently much more dis- interdisciplinary than the traditional view of criminology, say. So, for example, uh, architects and designers ought to be involved in crime, I would say, because the design of the physical environment can have a tremendous influence. So offenders find it more difficult to come in and get out easily. So the design of the urban environment influences things, but so too does um, more specific design of consumer goods. And also a lot of um, sort of um, crime that's using email and um, modern technologies, the internet, is sort of international and sort of crossing borders. Is is this something that comes into your work? And, And how does that complicate your research? I would say, yes, a lot of new technologies are what what have generated crime Mm -hmm. and that the overarching theoretical framework of my work in terms of um, crime opportunities applies to this again. The the internet Mm -hmm. and the internet of things generate new crime opportunities. What we know from what's happened in the past Mm -hmm. is that technology in terms of crime typically has a, a life cycle. When a new technology emerges, even though some other types of cybercrime are increasing, you get in cybercrime is a greater opportunity for one to many crimes. So for phishing, for example, one person uh, can run a, a botnet, a, a network of computers that send out thousands of potential phishing emails to different people. And, and, but I still think the basic principle of the response, we have now um, on servers to try and intercept those emails. We can blacklist them, block those emails. And try and have other efforts to reduce phishing. Shall we talk about it, the audience for your findings and how um, you go about um, generating impact from your research? So audience is at different levels, I would say, from um, high level government interventions in relation to crime to police interventions from crime and a range of other agencies in society that are involved in crime that may be um, social services, housing, different agencies are somehow connected to different types of crime in different ways. Mm-hmm. The government level interventions should be to try and encourage manufacturers, reduce their emissions of crime opportunities. You know, phone manufacturers inadvertently generate crime opportunities. And we are getting towards internet service providers are encouraged to reduce those opportunities by monitoring internet traffic, illegal pornography, child sexual abuse, child sexual exploitation, increasingly being encouraged to take responsibility for that in a similar way to which car manufacturers were being pressured to try and improve vehicle security. There are parallels with that now. Internet crimes has increased. What would you say has been the most beneficial change disseminating your work that it can assist this process? A study conducted by Paul Ekblom 
where people would go into the store all the time and steal things. And it generated dozens of responses each day from the police. And eventually the police said, we're going to stop responding to you because you're not taking any responsibility for the crime that your store has generated. The store changed some of its layout and changed its management practices, and it vastly reduced the number of calls for police responses. That is a specific example of the change that might have a research encourages to be adopted. I think we should maybe look more to the future now. So so where do you think your research is going to go? I want to continue the research into how crime has declined over many years because I think it's tremendously important. My association is with a group of scholars who define themselves as, as crime scientists who are distinct from other areas of criminology in mm. pursuing this approach. I am involved in research into crime during the pandemic and the effects upon crime have been dramatic and unprecedented. But it fits with the same theoretical mm. concept, I would say, of changing crime opportunities. People's movement patterns change. Retail areas, entertainment areas, there were not the same interactions between people that generated assaults, thefts, robberies, people not out on the street, on public transport. There are not the same level of crime opportunities that have generated crime. So many types of crime declined. At the same time, some types of crime increased because of new crime opportunities. People being in lockdown together in households generated increases in some forms of domestic abuse. People working from home, online leisure activities, online schooling means that some types of cybercrime have increased. How were you inspired into this field and what has kept you inspired? I worked on a crime survey. I had some quantitative skills and I analysed it and found that a lot of the same people were victimised again and again and that this was not represented in how crime was measured. And I went on to do my PhD on this topic of repeat victimisation. It became and is now quite commonplace in the study of crime, understand that a lot of crime is disproportionately experienced by the same people. Um, Nobody had approached it from this perspective and we thought, oh, let's have a look at it. That area has again proved to be a tremendously productive area for research. Yeah, so so that 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 keeps you inspired. Enjoyment of the, yeah, yeah, scientific um, story and the nature of scientific progress, I think. There is incremental progress and that it, the accumulation of knowledge takes a long time. Yeah. So. Um, that's a great That's a great point on which to end. The accumulation of knowledge takes a long time. Um, (laughs) Professor Graham Farrell, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Kate. 